In the crushing darkness of the Mariana Trench, where sunlight has never touched, and the pressure would turn steel into scrap, life persists in the most unexpected form. Over eight, zero meters beneath the surface so deep that Mount Everest could be dropped in and still be underwater the ocean, becomes a world of eternal night and unimaginable weight. And yet, in this desolate abyss, something moves. It was here, in the silent grave of the sea, that scientists encountered a mystery that defied everything they thought they knew. The discovery began with a routine expedition to the Challenger deep the deepest point in Earth's oceans. A remote operated submersible, armed with high definition cameras and powerful lights, descended into the blackness. Hours passed as it glided silently through the depths, capturing footage of lifeless sediment and ancient rock formations. Then, suddenly, a flicker, movement, life. Swimming effortlessly through the crushing pressure was a creature no larger than a human hand. Translucent and ghostly, it hovered like a phantom. It had no scales, its skin almost gelatinous, and its bones were so thin they bordered on non-existent. This was Pseudolipera swiri, the deepest dwelling fish ever recorded. To the scientific world, it became known as the Mariana Snailfisha marvel of evolutionary resilience. But in Guam, among the islanders who've lived near the trench for generations, it had another name. The Guardians of the Deep. According to local legend, these strange creatures were not merely fish, but the souls of sailors lost at sea. Their task? To patrol the deepest corners of the ocean and protect those who dared to venture into the unknown. Among those venturers was Dr. Enelie, Elena Vasquez, a marine biologist whose obsession with trench life had earned her a reputation for fearlessness and recklessness. For years, she had studied the data and footage from afar, but that was no longer enough. She wanted to see the Guardians herself. After months of preparation, she secured a seat in a titanium-reinforced submersible, the only one rated for such depths. The descent was long, almost spiritual. As the craft sank through layers of decreasing light, the silence grew heavier, more profound, until she could hear nothing but her own breath and the hum of machinery. Finally, the trench floor emerged from the darkness, and the lights revealed what she had traveled thousands of miles to see. They were there, small, spectral, and otherworldly. The snailfish danced through the frigid water like something out of a dream. They were not fleeing the lights they were investigating them. Dr. Vasquez watched breath caught in her throat as they circled the submersible with calm curiosity. And then, one approached, closer than any had ever come before. It pressed its delicate body against the thick glass, its black eyes locking with hers. Elena felt a shiver crawl down her spine. And then, the earth moved. Elena emerged from the submersible pale and shaken, salt clinging to her lips, adrenaline still coursing through her veins. The crew aboard the research vessel pulled her from the hatch with a mix of cheers and anxious questions, but she barely spoke. Her eyes were fixed on the ocean, as if still seeing those glowing shapes that had led her out of the abyss. That night, she reviewed the footage from the dive. There they were Pseudoliparis swire moving, not in chaos, but with a kind of organized intention. They weren't fleeing the landslide, they were leading. Her heart pounded again as she watched them spiral past the camera, always ahead of her, always turning just in time for her to follow. It wasn't just instinct, it was awareness. She sent the footage to her colleagues back at the Oceanic Research Institute, expecting skepticism. And it came, dressed in polite scientific jargon. Interesting behavior, likely coincidental. Attribution of intelligence to instinctual patterns is common. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But what stunned her more was what wasn't there. Frame after frame, the key moment the eye contact with the snailfish was gone. That section of the recording was corrupted, a blur of static and warped sound, as if something had erased it. A month later, Dr. Vasquez returned home to Guam to recover. There, she visited an old fisherman she'd spoken with years ago during an earlier expedition. 
He listened quietly to her tale, puffing on a hand-rolled cigarette, eyes never leaving the sea. They showed you, he said finally. You saw the guardians. I don't know what I saw, she replied. He smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. They say they only reveal themselves to those the ocean chooses. Elena laughed it off then, but that night, unable to sleep, she stared at her dive log, where she'd scribbled down what she thought was just a memory what the fish's eyes had conveyed to her when they met hers. A warning, a question, or maybe a message, not alone. In the weeks that followed, her obsession grew. She compiled historical accounts from trench explorations, unexplained anomalies, and even dismissed sailor stories. Time and again, she found references to strange fish, brief glimpses, dreams, and even disappearances near the trench's edge. Something or someone was watching from below, and every time she tried to put it aside, her dreams would return, glowing shapes in the dark, a chorus of pressure and silence, and that feeling deep in her gut, the abyss calling her back. Three months later, Dr. Eni Ting, Elena Vasquez was back aboard the Nereid, the same research vessel that had carried her to the trench before. This time, she wasn't alone. The scientific community had taken notice and note of her claims, but of her survival. Her encounter had stirred enough curiosity to fund a deeper, longer expedition. But Elena's reasons for returning were different. She didn't just want to study the snailfish. She wanted to understand why they had saved her. The new mission was outfitted with the most advanced submersible yet, the Bathonaut. Its hull could withstand greater pressure, its sensors could detect life forms in complete darkness, and its communication systems were designed to remain stable, even at Challenger Deep. As they descended again into the black, Elena kept her eyes glued to the viewing port. The light of the sun disappeared quickly. Soon, there was only the slow flicker of the Bathonaut's beams, cutting through the heavy void. Then, at eight, two hundred meters they appeared. Dozens of them, maybe hundreds, their translucent bodies shimmered in the artificial light, moving not like prey or predators, but like a school with purpose. This time, they didn't swirl. They circled, as if waiting. Are they guiding us again? Her co-pilot murmured. Elena didn't respond. Her breath caught as one snailfish came closer than the rest, close enough to touch the hull. Its dark, lidless eyes met hers again. And that's when the signal came through. Not a voice. Not sound. A frequency buried in the sonar feed. A pulse. Rhythmic. Structured. Repeating. Too deliberate to be geological. They weren't alone. Before the team could react, the Bathonauts' instruments spiked. A massive trench in the seabed was opening not a landslide, but a controlled shift. Something mechanical, ancient, perhaps living, was moving beneath them. For a split second, the sonar mapped the shape of something massive, deeper than anything they'd recorded before. Then it was gone. No data, no trace, just silence. The snailfish scattered. The Bathonaut began its ascent. Elena, shaking, downloaded the pulse data and stared at the repeating pattern on the screen. It wasn't random. It was a code. And as the Nereid broke the surface the next morning, the ocean calm around them, Elena realized this was no longer just about science. Something down there was communicating guarding something far older and more powerful than anyone had imagined. The Mariana snailfish weren't anomalies. They were sentinels. And the trench was not just deep, it was alive. Back on land, Dr. Elena Vasquez worked in secret. The world saw her as a marine biologist, but after the last dive, she had become something more, a messenger between worlds. The pulse code haunted her. It wasn't noise. It wasn't natural. It was language. With the help of cryptographers, linguists, and AI specialists, most of whom believed they were analyzing an ancient whale communication, Elena spent sleepless weeks decoding the sequence. Piece by piece, the message came into focus. 
one phrase repeated again and again, do not disturb the anchor. It made no sense at first. But then Elena remembered the sonar, the impossible shape beneath the trench, the mechanical shifting, a structure, a gate, a cage, or an anchor? She needed proof, evidence no one could ignore. So she went back one last time. This time, she descended alone. No crew, no interference, just her and the bathonaut gliding once more into the crushing black. She passed the layers of silent cold, the pressure mounted, and then the snailfish returned. But they were different. They didn't guide, they blocked her. Forming dense patterns in front of the sub, they pushed against the glass, flickering in synchronized bursts of bioluminescence. Not random this time, a warning. Turn back. But Elena pressed forward driven by curiosity or madness, she no longer knew. At eight 500 meters, the trench floor cracked open, the sub's sensors went blind, the hole groaned, and there it was again. The shape. Vast. Coiled. Not made of rock or metal, but flesh covered in ridges like gills, breathing slowly in the cold dark. Something ancient. Something bound. The snailfish scattered, terrified. Elena realized too late. The pulse code wasn't just a warning. It was containment. The Mariana snailfish weren't the guardians of the deep. They were jailers. And something inside that trench something older than the ocean itself wasn't supposed to wake up. The last thing Elena saw before her signal cut off was a single glowing eye opening in the dark. On the surface, the Nereid waited for a signal that never came, but far below, the trench pulsed again, and somewhere in the abyss, the anchor had shifted, 